Church, will you join me in welcoming everybody all over the world to Open Door Church? Let's go ahead and welcome everybody on the radio. All right. Okay. Well, guys, I want to welcome everybody here on a very special day. It's Palm Sunday, which doesn't mean you slap your neighbor. It's not like Palm Sunday. It's not that. And to help unpack a little bit about what Palm Sunday means, um, we have a very special guest here today. I, a, a few months back, I had the privilege of meeting Rabbi Jason, and um, I, I want to tell you, I just love this guy. Now, the very first time I met him was out at Third Sage Ranch. He came out to my ranch, and, and uh, I met him. It was late at night, and he, he showed up late at night, and, and we met him, and, and we hung out. We sat out on the porch, and we talked for a long, long, long time, and it was like we'd known each other for a long time just as soon as we met. Then we got in the car, and we started talking about time and physics and time-space continuums and how that fits into the Bible, and I, I, I wish you could have been a fly on the wall when we were going off on that, it was so much fun. And then we came here and we filmed some, we filmed some things for TroyBird.tv and we, we did a bunch of radio and we did all that. Well, then just a few weeks ago, we, we're always in contact with each other and he's a hard guy to keep up with because of what God is doing with him right now. But I had an opportunity to go to New York City and I had never done the New York City thing. I've been in, I've been in LaGuardia a million times, but have never actually gone into the city. And it wasn't because I'm scared. It's just because I, you know, I just didn't have time. I'm always on the way somewhere else. But I went up there with Steve, with Steve uh, and, and with the Casey Donahue Band. And a bunch of guys in the Casey Donahue Band uh, actually play here, including Taz. Taz played in, you know, our drummer played in the Casey Donahue Band for like 15 years. And went up there because they have a Celebrate Texas Independence Day at Times Square. Okay, so I went up there to celebrate Texas independence in Times Square, and I wore my hat, and it was like, hey, fellas, where's your horses? It was awesome. It was, it was great, man. It was just so cool. Anyway, I got up the next morning and met Rabbi Jason at Ben's Deli, which is a kosher deli. And can you imagine, very first time in New York City, at a real kosher deli sitting with a rabbi. I want to tell you, come on, man. That's like seeing Charlie Daniels at the Grand Ole Opry. That's what that's like. That's like running into Willie and Waylon in, in Lukenbach. That's what that's like. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we sat in there, and I had real pastrami. Now, I had never been a pastrami guy because, you know, pastrami down here comes in a can like spam, right? But up there, it's real, man. And it was like, oh, that's what pastrabi is supposed to be. So that's one of the layers of hanging around all of these Messianic Jews. Not only do you get next level revelation about heaven and earth, but pastrami. <laughs> now, you might have recently seen him on television. He's been on Dr. Oz. He's been on the Good Morning America. When I was in Belize last week, I turned on Good Morning America, and he was on. And I took a picture like, dude, I'm watching you in the jungles of Central America, man. How crazy is that? Him and Kathleen Gifford just came out with this book that's called The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. That's what it's called. And if you want to know about all this, it's actually uh, number, it was number, it's number two or number three on the New York Times bestsellers list right now, which is just bringing Jesus to the front, and I'm so glad about that. But if you want to know what it's really about, when you guys get the book, I want you guys to look at it. Let's go ahead and let's keep that picture on there. Look at how huge Kathy Lee Gifford's name is. And if you squint your eyes, I mean, look really hard, bust out a telescope. It says, let me, let me try and make it out, with Rabbi Jason Sobel. Okay, he's on here, but you just got to look for his name, okay? Open Door Church, let's give a great big Johnson County, Texas welcome to my very good friend, Rabbi Jason Sobel. Hey! <laughs> I love you, man. Have a good time. This water here is yours, and it's kosher. Oh, this is mine? Are those my glasses? So. I believe so. I love you, man. So, Lord, I just want to thank you for my brother. Thank you. And I just want to lift him up to you. Yep. I just want to lift him up to you. And I just want to thank you for him. And I want to thank you, Lord, that he 
more than almost many of the pastors I know, Lord, and leaders embodies the heart of Jesus. I thank you that his heart is for everyone, but especially for the least of these. And I thank you, Lord, that you've anointed him in this house to proclaim liberty to the captives. And I thank you, Lord, that the true meaning of the prophetic is being released in this house. The true meaning of the prophetic is to release the bonds of slavery and to share your food with the hungry, Isaiah 58, and then you will ride on the clouds of heaven, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. And so we thank you for the heritage. We thank you, God, for what you're doing through this house. And we thank you, God, that, that the wealth of the nations will flow to this place because this is an apostolic center that is releasing resources to those that are in need yes. to bring healing, light, and love, not only to Texas, but also to the world. Yes. So we say, God, this is going to be a season of yes. overflow of John chapter 2, filled to the brim in every capacity. Not only every seat will be filled in the near future for every service, but God, the resources will flow to set the captives free and to do the work of the kingdom. So I bless my brother. I bless this house in the name of your son, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. The Osher HaKavod Milfanecha, wealth and honor come before him before you, Lord. Biadecha Bekoach Uvarad is in your hand to make great and strong. Strengthen my brother. Strengthen his family, Lord. Strengthen this church family in the name of your son. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Love you too. Shalom. Can you say shalom? shalom? I am so excited to be here with you this morning. Really, it is, it is an honor to be here with you all. And I'm super excited because I mean that, like what the work, the work that you guys are doing here is absolutely incredible and amazing. And it was great to be able to connect with you some, last some of you sometimes, but I always like to begin when I come to a place for a first time on a Sunday morning to visit a little bit and quickly share a little bit about my story. I grew up in a traditional Jewish family in the Holy Land, New Jersey, <laughs> or as I like to say, Jew Jersey. More Jews than in Jerusalem. Went, grew up going to Hebrew school as a child. Had my bar mitzvah. Lost much of my family in the Holocaust. Got into all sorts of trouble when I was in high school. Wound up getting kicked off the basketball team. Dropping out of high school. Started hanging out with the local D, the high school DJ and drug dealer. Joined a wannabe Filipino gang, got into all sorts of trouble, and eventually found myself working in a large recording studio in New York City, looked at the lives of all these people around me and said, there has to be more to life than just this. Went on a spiritual journey, studying with my rabbi, started studying martial arts. One day I was meditating, like also studying uh, Eastern philosophy, was meditating. My soul began to vibrate. It left my body. The next thing I knew, I was in heaven. and. And I felt the power of God pulsating through my body, every cell of my being coming alive. And I saw this king, Ram Vanisa, high and lifted up in this glorious light. And I didn't know anything about Jesus. His Hebrew name is Yeshua. Can you say Yeshua? Yeshua. But I knew that was him, and he told me I was called to serve him. The next thing I know is down in my body, still shaking under the power of heaven. Had no idea what, I knew, had no idea what this all meant. I knew he was real. My best friend called me up. He said, Jason, I found the truth. I'm like, what's that? He's like, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, but if you don't believe in him, you're going to hell, and in the end times, there's going to be this beast with all these heads that eat people that don't believe. <laughs> I said, dude, I don't know what you put in your hookah, what you're smoking there. He gained a little bit more sensitivity, started to attend a messianic congregation, called me back on the telephone. He said, Jason, can you tell the difference between the Old and the New Testament? You went to Hebrew school? I said, sure. He read me this passage about the crucifixion. I said, New Testament. He said, let me read you another passage, bruised for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, by his stripes were healed. I said, that's the New Testament. He said, no, Jason, I'm sorry, that's Isaiah 53, the Jewish prophet speaking 700 years before Messiah walked the face of the earth. I began to be provoked to jealousy. 
Come on now. You got to do some provoking. Attended a Messianic congregation. Maybe you heard Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, the harbinger. And uh, at the end of the service, they dimmed the lights and prayed. I figured I needed all the help I can get. So I prayed. They said, if you prayed this prayer for the first time, raise your hand. I raised my hand. I said, if you raise your hand, you have to stand up. You've just been born again. I said, born to who? I heard about these born again people. The, I, I, I'm an, I gave my mother enough trouble when I was born once. God only knows if I was born again. And I've seen these people with big hair, televangelists, pickup trucks, guns, I don't know, this stuff. I can't do this. I'm a Jewish kid from New Jersey. The only thing I ever hunted for was bargains in the mall. Come on. But they said, we saw you raise your hand. You have to stand up. We weren't going anywhere until I stood up. So I stood up. They gave me the first New Testament I'd ever seen, took it home, hit it, didn't know what I'd just done. Curiosity got the best of me. I read it for the first time, blown away how Jewish the New Testament was, the Messianic prophecies being fulfilled. And then what the Lord said to me in that encounter in heaven was a verse from the New Testament. And I was like, oh my God, this is real. I gave my life to him, was instantaneously transformed. My mom finds the Bible. What is this that I found in your room? Don't tell me you come into those Jews who believe in Jesus. I knew you'd break my heart one day and do this. Go meet with the rabbi. It's another story for another time. <laughs> in the midst of all this, I get a, a collect call from a homeless friend from New York City. Needed to have both legs amputated from gangrene, frostbite, from sleeping outside. I go to the hospital. I just read the book of Acts, what do I know? It says Jesus healed, he, he's, you can heal in his name. So I don't know, I just, that's before you go to study the Bible and tell you those things don't happen anymore. <laughs> Laid my hands on him, said silver and gold have I none, what I have in the name of Yeshua, rise, take up your bed and walk. He got healed, he got saved, and he walked out of the hospital, <laughs> praise God. And there was no going back from that point. And God is good. Just like he raised my friend out of that hospital bed, we're in a season of resurrection. We're in the decade of the eyes on the Hebrew calendar, 57, 78, 70 is the number of the eyes. It's time to see some stuff. And this month that we're in right now is a month of Nisan. Can you say Nisan? And Nisan comes from the Hebrew word, which means miracles. This month means miracle of miracles. Yeah. Friends, turn to someone and say, this is a month of miracles. Yeah. Say it, a month of miracles. Yeah. Guys, this is a season where God did some of the greatest miracles in history. Ten miracles to bring Israel out of Egypt, eleventh, the parting of the Red Sea. It's a season of the last week of Messiah's life. And actually what I love about this year is that this year, the biblical chronology of the actual week lines up with the exact time frame of the week when the year Jesus came. This is actually Palm Sunday would have been today on the Hebrew calendar. Doesn't happen every year. Friday night would have, been, would have been the Passover. So this is that time. It's amazing. And God's into times and seasons. And it was on this day, a very significant day. It's the day when Messiah Yeshua Jesus rode into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, verse 1 through 11. We read about the story of Palm Sunday known as the triumphal entry. I'm going to be reading from the Tree of Life version, a messianic, first messianic trans, modern translation of the Bible done by rabbis and scholars. 
We read this, now as they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Yeshua sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village before you right away and you'll find a donkey tied up and a colt with her. Unite them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the master has need of them and right away he will send them. This happened to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet saying, see your king is coming to you, humble and sitting on a donkey, a colt the fowl of a donkey, the foal of a donkey, the disciples went and did as Yeshua had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their clothing on them, and he sat on the clothing. And most of the crowd spread their clothing on the road, and others began cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going before him and those following kept shouting and saying, Hoshiana to Ben David, Hosanna to the son of David, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hoshiana, salvation in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred saying, who is this? And the crowds kept saying, this is the Navi, this is the prophet Yeshua from Nazareth, from Nazareth in the Galilee. Friends, did you ever wonder why he had to ride in on a donkey into Jerusalem? This is a fulfillment of an important prophecy that we're gonna talk about, but also the rabbis recognize something significant. They say this, if Israel is worthy of redemption, the Messiah will come riding on the clouds of heaven, like in Daniel chapter seven, but if Israel is unworthy, he will come to you a pauper, humble, riding on a donkey. Israel was not worthy of the redemption. Like none of us are worthy of the redemption. So he comes not in power, he comes humbly riding on a donkey, and actually in Jewish thought there are two aspects of the Messiah. There is one aspect of the Messiah which is Messiah, son of Joseph, say son of Joseph. Son of Joseph is, he gets his... He gets his name from the story of Joseph, which is one of the greatest types of Messiah in the scriptures. Uh, Joseph's brothers are jealous of him. They throw him in a pit. They strip him. They throw him in a pit. They sell him for silver. He He eventually gets promoted from the pits to the prison, to the palace, and becomes second in power to the king seated at his right hand. And he is the one who is not recognized the first time his brothers come down, but only the second time they come down is he revealed to them. Then Israel understands, and he says, God sent me ahead of you to save life, and he saved their lives from Egypt and Israel. Israel and the nations are saved because of Joseph's rejections and sufferings so God could position him in the palace where he needed to be to save lives. A picture of Messiah, a type of Messiah. Then there's a son of David, King David, one of the greatest warriors in the history of Israel. He is the one who's going to conquer the forces of evil. He is the one who's going to establish the messianic kingdom and bring peace and shalom, bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And let me tell you what, is the the, the Israelites, the, the Hebrews in the days of Messiah, they didn't want the son of Joseph, they wanted the son of David. They wanted someone to come and deliver them from Rome and from the oppression oppression that they had experienced. But what they didn't understand, and oftentimes we fail to understand, is that redemption requires a process. Messiah had to come as the lamb before he could be revealed as the lion. Friends, God made many promises about the messianic redemption and the establishment of the kingdom, but you can't have the promise without the process. Turn to someone and say, you need the process for the promise. Even Yeshua needed the process. He first had to become the lamb before he could be revealed as the lion. He had to go through the sufferings before he could have the power of the resurrection. And the same is true for you and for me. Guys, I am am overwhelmed. I never thought in a million years that God would bless me with the grace to have a book on the number times bestseller list. 
even if my name is small, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> but this is what we're talking about. The king comes humbly and riding on a donkey. I'm the donkey, by the way. <laughs> humbly. I'd rather be Messiah's donkey than uh, the high priest. But here's the thing. I had to go through the pits and the prisons. I moved out to California 10 years ago, what I thought was my dream job. Not being out there very long, I got fired, thrown into the pits by some of my spiritual fathers, almost lost everything. And it God told me, I'm going to take you through a season of Joseph's. You're going to be rejected. You're going to go through hardships. But I'm doing all of this to purify you, to take you as the process to teach you to depend upon me, not on your gifts, not on other people, but to depend upon me. And when I've done my work in you, I will take you from prison to the palace. I will promote you. People like, I'm getting calls, Jason, we can't believe we've seen your book in Costco. We've seen your book in this, right? And, and we've seen you on the rap, my fulfilled the lifelong dream of rapping on the doctor on, on national television. But let me tell you what, and, and, and you know what, and there's some people like, man, would you, would you, would you man, I pray that would you, that happened to me too, like, good, bless me that God will let me have, let me tell you what, you know how many tears were shed? You know how much pain, even right now? Because you, like Messiah, you have to endure the cross, because you can't have the crown without experiencing the cross. God has to break us before He makes us. He has to humble us before He promotes us. And I want you to turn to someone and say, your rejection will lead to your promotion. Now I know Pastor Troy knows a little something about this. And your cross, turn to someone and say, your cross is key to your crown. Friends, He can't give you the power of His resurrection if you're not willing to experience the fellowship of His sufferings. He doesn't need any more non-leaders, who, people who aren't broken. God's into times and seasons. Every major event in the life of Jesus happened on a biblical holiday. He dies at the Passover lamb, rises on first fruit, pours out his spirit on Pentecost. And on this day that Messiah rode into Jerusalem was the day the Passover lambs were set aside for slaughter four days before the Passover. He was riding in on the day the lambs were selected, and he was going to be inspected by the leaders, found unworthy in their sight, but worthy in God's sight. To offer himself as a living sacrifice. But I want to take a deeper look at this. And so he comes in riding on a donkey. It's a fulfillment of Zechariah, Zechariah 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, so your king is coming to you humble and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the, the fall of a donkey. So before the people wanted the Messiah to come as a king, they expect a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but he comes riding on a donkey. With a, with a fowl with him. Part of, so there's an older and a younger. Part of what I think this represents is one represents heaven, one represents earth. One represents the old covenant, and one represents the new covenant of what God is about to do, the fusion of the old and the new. But donkeys in Scripture are very uh, significant. Think about it for a moment. When Abraham went to offer his son, he put all of his stuff on a what? Donkey. When Moses comes to redeem Israel out of Egypt, what does he do? He puts his wife and his children on a donkey. And it actually says in Hebrew, the donkey, and the rabbis say the donkey that Abraham rode is the same donkey that Moses rode into Jerusalem and that Messiah himself will ride the same donkey that God has preserved supernaturally. 
And so Messiah riding the donkey is the ultimate redemptive task. Like Abraham and Moses used the donkey to fulfill their divine mission, Jesus, Yeshua, is the greater Moses. He is the greater than Abraham. He says, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. He comes to fulfill all of this, and there is a progression that is going on here of Messiah riding the donkey, which is really significant, and, and that is this. In Hebrew, the word for donkey is chamor. You got to say chamor. Spit on your neighbor. Chamor. The root word for donkey is the word in Hebrew, homer, which means materialism or crassness. The donkey is a symbol in Jewish thought of the material world, of the crassness of this world, of labor and toil in this world. It's an un one of the ultimate unclean animals in Jewish thought. Messiah comes riding in this donkey. Why? Because it's a symbol of the king of Israel, of heaven invading earth, and of him taking back dominion and authority over the physical world and over all creation. But it also teaches us this. It teaches us that God wants us to take dominion and authority over the material world. Listen, we oftentimes think of the, of the spiritual world as being better than the spiritual reality, but the reality is God wants us to elevate the material world, the physical reality, and infuse it with spirituality and use it for the kingdom of God. As it says in Zechariah, when the Messiah comes on that day, even the pots and the pans will be holy to the Lord. Friends, everything can be made holy to the Lord. Sex can be holy to the Lord. Your job can be holy to the Lord. Everything you do, eating and drinking, can be holy to the Lord when you do it with the intention of using it to expand the kingdom and invite the Lord into the midst of it. We have a responsibility to sanctify everything that God has given us and use the things on earth for the sake of bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. So because at, at the fall what happened, we broke the connection between heaven and earth, and Messiah comes to restore the connection. He represents heaven, the donkey represents earth, he's reconnecting and uniting the two, and that's what we are called to do. But here is the reality, so often times because we are physical beings and we live in a world where we have real needs that we need to get met, oftentimes we are so focused on the physical that we neglect the spiritual and we make our material needs primary and our spiritual needs secondary and we make our work becomes our life. And we get, and America is all into materialism. That's the donkey. So I got a question for you today. This is, a, this is a serious question. Are you riding the donkey or is the donkey riding you? No. Turn to someone and say, are you riding the donkey or is the donkey riding you? Wow. Friends, if you are not putting the kingdom of God first, if you're living in worry and fear and running around only trying to meet your material needs, if that is the goal of your existence, friends, I got the question. I'm going to tell you, you're the ass. <laughs> Let's just be real. Don't let the donkey ride you. Don't be controlled by the, by the material things, by your, by your physical desires. Don't be driven by these things. Your identity and your value doesn't come from what you have. It comes from who you are in him as a son and a daughter. <laughs> Friends, you know why heaven, the streets of heaven are paved with gold? Because God's a hip hopper. He's into the bling, frosted, no. <laughs> Not the case. We love gold on earth. Gold is symbol symbolic of wealth in the Bible. We love wealth. We love nice things. Nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you what. In, in heaven, what people devote their lives to, steal for, kill for, cheat for, die for, 
is only worth being pavement in heaven. The kingdom of God reverses the values of this world, and in heaven we walk on the values of this world. Amen? Knowing that, you know what the Lord told me, whenever you speak, I want you to tell this story. I was getting ready one morning, and the, as, as I was spending time with the Lord and talking to Him, He said, Jason, you're my favorite son. I said, thank you, Lord. It means a lot to me. It really touched me. He says, when you go out there and speak, I want you to tell people J- that, tell them, Jason, you're my favorite son. I said, Lord, I can't do that. People are going to stone me. I'm not going to, I want to come humbly riding on a donkey, right? Not, and he's like, Jason, the reason why you don't want to say it is not because you're scared of what people think. The reason why you don't want to say it is because you can't believe that you could actually be my number one son and that I could love you that much. He said, Jason, I'm a father and you're a father, but I'm not a father like you're a father. I'm the eternal and infinite father. And I can have an infinite number of number one sons and daughters. And they're all my favorite. (laughs) Friends, you got to understand, this is a season when he rides into Jerusalem at Passover. He wants them to understand that our material wealth doesn't define us. It's not where our value comes from. Friends, that's Egypt. That's slavery, a slavery to the things of this world. He comes as the Passover lamb to redeem us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He doesn't want us bound to the things of this world. He wants us to ride the donkey, to use the things of this world for the purposes of heaven. But we can only do that. We're humble because we're servants, but we're not slave servants. We are royal sons and daughters. Amen? Turn to someone and say, you're his number one son. Or you're his number one daughter. I want to get gender issues into this. Friends, you got to know that. You got to know a number one son and daughter. That's how he sees you. That's part of coming out of Egypt. He comes riding in on these donkeys, as much more we could say, some of this is in the book. And then what he does is he lay, they lay down palm branches at his feet. Now when we think of palm branches, we also think, oh, it's a symbol of peace. The donkey is a symbol of peace. No, let me tell you, friends, it's the exact opposite. The donkey, when Solomon was crowned king, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. They were seeing him as the greater than Solomon riding in as the son of David. They cry out, son of David, save us. They see a replay of Solomon coming in. This is the one. He's going to break out the sword. He's going to roll up his sleeves and he's going to get down. He's going to tear up some of those Romans. He's going to redeem us. The palm branches in Israel's history were a sign of freedom and fruitfulness. If you know the story of Hanukkah, the Maccabees, when they won their, when they won their national independence again, they minted coins with palm trees on them. Herod minted coins with palm trees on them, palm branches. And in Greco-Roman culture, palm branches were a sign of victory and success. The word palma in Latin means victory. And so it was a symbol of victory that they were waving before the Lord as they recited Psalm 18, parts of Psalm 118, which is the most quoted messianic psalm in the New Testament. Adonai Hoshiana, the Lord save us. Adonai Lord grant us success. But it also says this, yes, success. But before the success comes, it says this, Evan ma'asu habonim pina. The stone which the builders have rejected have become the chief cornerstone. 
the rejection before the promotion. They're thinking he is the messianic king. They want victory. And the good news is, friends, in the book, that wasn't the time. First he comes as the lamb, then he comes as the lion. But when he returns, when we look in heaven, what are the saints in heaven holding in their hands and waving in the book of Revelation? Palm branches! Because we will overcome. Friends, in this world, you might be humbly and riding a donkey, but let me tell you what, you're a son and daughter of the king, and you have overcome. You are a victor. The victory is yours. You need to know that. See, friends, it's okay to go through the fellowship of the sufferings when you know the power of the resurrection. We need both. And then he comes into Jerusalem, and what's the very next thing we read? He goes up to the path, he goes up to the temple, and he overturns the tables of the money changers. Why? Because that Passover, you know what I, this is, this should be every woman's favorite holiday, should be Passover. I'm going home tomorrow, and I'm going to clean my house from top to bottom, because you have to remove all the leaven for Passover, spring cleaning Jewish style. It's intricate. He, he turns over the money changes because there could be no leaven found in the house. Leaven is a symbol of sin. He was removing the sin from the father's house because he's God's son and that's his father's house. And so at this season, we, we, we have to understand that we need to clean the leaven from our lives. The leaven of bitterness. We need to remove the leaven of of disappointment. We need to remove the leaven of anger. We need to remove whatever those things in our life that are keeping us from fully knowing Him, from fully serving Him, just like we do a spring cleaning in our li- in our house. We need to do a spring cleaning in our lives at this season. Palm Sunday is meant to prepare us for Passover, for his death on Good Friday, and for the resurrection of the Messiah. This is a time to prepare our hearts, to prepare our inner house for the King. It's amazing that not too long ago in Israel, they found the remains of 2,000-year-old date palm seeds. What they were waving was date palms on Palm Sunday. And they decided to plant those palms, seeds. And guess what? After 2,000 years, those palm seeds took root. And palm trees began to grow from them. Now, there are male palm trees and there are female palm trees, and they have to pollinate one another to bear fruit, and they did. The male was called Methuselah. (laughs) And after 2,000 years, these seeds bore fruit. Friends, that is a prophetic picture of the season that we're in, of things coming full circle, and of Psalm 92. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree planted in the house of Adonai. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still be fruitful in old age and will be full of sap and freshness. And they will declare Adonai is upright, my rock. There is no injustice in him. So, Abu, I just want to thank you for everyone here, that the righteous, these are the righteous. They are like the palm trees, and you promise that they will be planted in the house of the Lord, and that even in old age, they will bear fruit. And so we declare the fruitfulness. I declare refreshment over you. I declare renewal over you. I declare this is a time where you've sown in tears that you will reap the harvest with joy. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, we call forth abundant fruit, and we say, May God renew your days as of old. In Jesus' name, amen.